No, the plaza. They had six licenses per year that they offered artists to paint on the plaza in downtown Santa Fe. Well, my about the first few days I was out, I was visited by this little lady who turned out to be, she was Miss Jameson. And she owned the Jameson Galleries in Santa Fe, which one of the, was one of the most, if not the most, um, prestigious gallery in Santa Fe. And she said, you know, if you have time, I would like for you to visit my, my gallery. And this is my card. Please come by. And so my first break I got, I, I went over to the gallery. And she said, you know, I w I've watched you for a couple of days, and I like what you're doing. And I would like to offer you the opportunity to paint in my gallery or to show with me at my gallery. So I says, well, let me think about it. Because I didn't really know just how prestigious this person was in art. So then I goes back to the downtown plaza and I sat on my spot and I said, other artists came to me and says, I saw you, you was with Miss Jameson, Jameson gallon. And I says, yeah, do you know her? And they said, no, her. everybody that's in a resident art knows this lady. I said, well, she asked me if I would show in her gallery. Oh, they didn't believe it. It was, you know, they just didn't believe it. So actually I went over there the next day and I said, yeah, I would like to show in your gallery. She said, the only thing about it is just, is that I don't want you to paint on the plaza because uh, I'm gonna be able to sell, I don't know how much you anticipate making this summer, but you're gonna sell three or four pictures will probably make more than you'll make there all summer. So you had to give up so, the plaza. So I gave up the plaza, and I started showing with her. And then when people would talk to me at other places, they would say, well, where do, where do you show? Where have you shown? I say, well, I show in Margaret Jameson's gallery in Santa Fe. You're in. So that was a stepping stone for me. I stayed with her until she passed away. As as uh, as an artist in her gallery, and which was a great step, stepping stone, and was wow. in there with a lot of very famous artists, Wilson Hurley, and people that are now gone. But Charlie Dye, my former teacher at the Colorado Institute of Art, she. Uh, but anyway, I just uh, that was just one way that kept building on <laughs> on that. You have received some incredible awards, um, the mayor's uh, recognition. Right. You're in the Hall of Fame at the Colorado Institute of Art. Well, yes, yes. What does that mean? Well, it. the thing about it is, even having gone to the Colorado Institute of Art for uh, uh, all this time, uh, in the beginning, I... <laughs> It was years before I, I got my uh, degree from the school, and then uh, but they had I guess they heard that I was uh, a former member of the uh, because it had gone through different different hands, and uh, they had uh, heard that I my paintings were selling all over the world, so they they called me and said you know you are a member you are one of our alumni you went here from such and such a year to such and such a year. And uh, we would like to make you, a, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna start this hall of fame and we would like you to be a part of that. And uh, so that's that's how that happened. So, uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll also give you your certificate of completion. Because I, and I said, well, because I never really got one, but, uh, but they gave me my certificate they checked all the records and gave me my certificate, and uh, I was happy. And to this day, all this helps to build on what I'm doing. 
uh, then uh, that's how I uh, I met the people at the Ramada Inn who happened to see me at a show, and they recognized the the talent that I have and what I had done and what I stood for in the Denver community and how I help children and uh, teach classes and furnish supplies. And uh, they said, uh, and they bought a picture from me, a painting, and then uh, asked me to come by and see their Ramadi Inn and maybe we were something that we could do to help you. This was another thing that sort of, that really, really helped me. And that's why I'm here today, because the people have been very, very acceptable to what I'm doing. And they appreciate it. I have paintings in different parts of the hotel, as you've seen them before. And uh, so. But it makes your art accessible to be in a location where people, and not necessarily they're coming to see the art, but they come here to the Ramada and they see your art. Right. How does that um, spread the word, if you will? Well, for instance, uh, since I've been here at the Ramada, there's been other locations that'll come by and say, why don't you show an art play? And I'll say, well, I'm here at the Ramada. And, and uh, so if I start going to other places and here and there, then, then that's not going to work. This is a prestigious hotel. It's very, very well known all over the United States and all over the world. So just to say that, like the Jameson Gallery in Santa Fe, that I paint at the Ramada. So it's a, it's another stepping stone on the way up, of which I haven't got all the way up yet. So I just keep looking for stepping stones in, in my life. You're amazing. The Ra Ramada Inn is just another one. Uh -huh. You're amazing as a working artist. Right. And that's it's rare across the across the spectrum, but for a black male to be a working artist. Mm -hmm. Well, and now with with the changes and all the different laws and the acceptance of whatever is going on and and uh, it's uh I have uh, started to do uh, well, I've been doing them for years, but I kind of started doing my paintings on little cigarette rolling papers. So when I go to the the what they call head shops or whatever on uh, Colfax, and I buy ten packages of rolling papers, then. They, these people say, you know, this, this guy must smoke an awful lot of pot. I mean, he's in here buying all these cigarette papers. And I'll say, well, I don't know what they get for a sticker there, whatever they're selling. I said, but it couldn't be $300. And that's what my paintings on these cigarette papers sold for 20 years ago in Santa Fe. Painting on cigarette papers. And now I'm doing them again. And they're starting to sell a little bit here and there. So you so, go from from uh, full so, house portraits to cigarette to uh, art on cigarette papers, right? Your technique, or is it the same to paint a big portrait as a cigarette paper? Well, it's the process of of doing a small painting like that. Uh, a lot of people can paint small as a, or smaller than than I'm painting probably or as small as my cigarette painting papers. But they don't know how to get the painting on the cigarette papers. And that's what I do. I know how to do it my way. And for fun, sometimes the, uh, other artists come and they'll try to figure it out and they'll say, how do you paint that small on a cigarette rolling paper? And I say, well, you have to get some stretchers to stretch it. And then I tell them, oh, something is wrong. And, and unless they take a class. If they come in, take a class, and, and help me out financially, then I may let on to the, I let on to the secret of 
how I paint on cigarette paper, rolling papers. So you're still teaching? Well, from time to time, yes. I closed that shop down because of a flood. And so uh, now I'm kind of in the process soon of being able to find another location. Well, and you mentioned the five points, so we, we, we have to talk about, because you've been around Denver mm -hmm. for a long time, you've seen a lot of changes in that neighborhood. Right. And right now they're going through another um, redevelopment uh, push. And the this time, it appears that the redevelopment of Five Points is going to change the makeup of the neighborhood. As someone who grew up with Five Points and has worked an old property in Five Points and, and been a part of the community, how does that feel? Well, it was I was there during the uh, the heyday of the Five Points. Uh, the night of the clubs and the jazz players and blues players. I've, I've always been interested in music also because I was a member of the band in uh, Manuel High School and uh, I played uh, drums and I eventually got into conga drums and, and uh, then I got into playing. Uh, I'm always looking for something that's not going to cost me much to get into. So a fella came through town and he played spoons. And that was his name. He named his name was Spoons. Everybody knew him. And uh, so I was very fascinated by the way he handled spoons and played. And he knew knew that I was interested. So he did help me along those lines. And then uh, I got into the uh, more than the percussions like I was in, but I got into conga drums because I could turn a bucket upside down and practice my conga drums, you know, but I didn't have a conga drum at the time. And then uh, I heard once that there was Mongo Santa Maria, uh, who I didn't even know of, uh, was coming to town and I should go hear him. And I went to hear him play. And I was so fascinated that when he was on break, I grabbed his drum and played and, and then he came back off a break and i'll say oh i'm in trouble now and then he walks up and he says no you're not to keep playing you i like what you're doing so i i watched him over and over and during the week that he was here for two weeks and learned a lot more so i got in the, and i still do that and i still play the spoons and uh doing my jazz music paint. Jazz musicians and blues musicians. Uh, I lived in Chicago for a while. One one uh, time I spent my uh, uh, time in Chicago. I uh, met people and I had a um, girlfriend in Chicago, and we uh, I I see we were staying together in uh, in a hotel with uh, not, not a hotel but a house with. Uh, our roommate was an older gentleman, and his name was Sonny Land Slim. And then I said, uh, I never heard of him. But I, but he's a great jazz and blues play, a great blues player. And here I am sharing the same house with him and his wife. And uh so then I got more into that and then listening to blues, more blues and more jazz and increasing my, my knowledge in those mediums. And uh, that's the way all that happened. Well, and the, the, the other thing I want to ask you about is you do some interesting things with cityscapes. Right. Um, Everybody walks down the street, but nobody sees on the street the kinds of things that you capture in your cityscape. Well, I, I have to kind of laugh because uh, I I sort of came up with uh, a unique idea 
of not painting the city like the city really looks, but to paint it with a humor that I, and I call him whimsical paintings of the area. And where I'm able to use my artistic ability plus, plus capture a little humor and, and incorporate some of the people that I've met into these pictures. And uh, then I says, they were selling so well and so fast, I started making prints out of them. And then uh, it got to be where I had five of them, 10 of them, 15 paintings, uh, whimsical paintings. And then people started collecting them. See, I got the one of this area. I've got that one of that area. I've got that bear downtown. I've got this. And that's the way that I started building and building and building. Now, I don't know how many I have, but I have a lot of them. And they all have personality. And, 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 people, and people love them. And people that, I've got the restaurants on Colfax now, some of the restaurants and, uh, and uh, the bar fronts or the different places, the places of business and that I see that's colorful and interesting and people are going in and coming out and and I just put all this into the painting. I may put some people in from the past, like Billie Holiday. I've got her in a few of my whimsical painting drawings, see, and uh, different people like that. Uh, so, so carry on. Yeah, you you do portraits, you do landscapes, you do city cityscapes. What's your favorite? What do you what do you really love doing this while I'm taking the talk so as a talk wall? No, say that again. Yeah. <laughs> we were interrupted by sorry. You do portraits. You do landscapes, you do cityscapes, you do cigarette paper. What's your favorite? Well, I, I don't think that I really have a favorite. Uh, pastels will always be, and charcoal drawings will always be among my favorites. But uh, I never know what leads, what uh, I'm going to find humor in to create these humorous, uh, whimsical drawings. So I'm always on the move. Uh, I may go to the, uh, over to the Colorado Museum of Natural History someday, and I'm sure that I'm going to enjoy sketching the wolves and the, the, uh, the animals there and putting them in, in something, you know, in, into my paintings or drawings or whimsicals or whatever. Um, so What's that's... What's the secret to your success with pastels? What is it? What's the secret to your success with pastels? I probably, the, the use of color. I've, I've, uh, I've studied with some... I've always taken workshops. I've spent a lot of money taking workshops with people that I consider real good and who offer workshops. So if I had the chance to meet these people and see that they're giving workshops, then I save my money and whatever it takes, I'll go and I'll take a workshop. I used to, I, I'm older now, I can't get around like that, but I used to go all the way to Santa Fe, to Scottsdale, Arizona, to Laguna Beach, California, to study with somebody for a week. <laughs> so that uh, I've I've, I've uh, furthered my own education through studying with people that I consider the best. I've got uh, I I didn't meet Nikolai Fashion. He's was always one of my favorite uh, artists, but I did meet his daughter and uh, got to know her. Through my travels, that I uh, she inspired me to keep. I'm sorry. Should I get you some waters? 
Oh, no, that's okay. Um, anyway, okay, let's go. You ready? Uh, I, I was able to uh, uh, be inspired by... Uh, I was able to be inspired by these people who could tell me a little bit about their past and the artists that they grew up with. And uh, I also studied with the, one of the many artists, Daniel Green. <laughs> That's the mold on the cloud. So anyway, I, I've studied with these other artists, and especially this is the good one, the ones that I consider now, just because I consider them as being great, that's no sign that they're great for everybody. But the ones that I pick, I, I love what they do. And so their technique and their use of color and their pastels and whatever they do. You mentioned, though, and, and I wasn't going to, um, I don't want to work on but um, the environmental situation that has happened with the studio um, on Welter um, has created some health concern. Mm. And um, it seems like in my study, yeah. all great yeah. artists have had to go through. Yes, right. Those health challenges that you're facing now, how is that affecting or influencing your artistic, your creativity? Well, uh, as uh, going to the uh, National Joy's Hospital to uh, find out what the problem really is, I was given a test on being a, on my allergies, and I'm allergic to everything that I'm painting. I'm allergic to dogs and cats and wolves, and weeds and bushes and trees and mountains and everything that I like to paint. I'm, I'm allergic to it. But with my knowledge of all of these subjects, I still continue to paint them. Just like I paint my little cigarette papers or whatever I paint, and my big landscapes are not painted on location, but from memory. So I've seen enough of them to paint them and keep creating different ones that uh, I don't have to stand in the middle of a bunch of roses and paint them and sneeze and call. So you're overcoming the allergies with your... I'm allergic to everything I paint. Oh, Wow. I'm probably an oil, oil paint. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. And uh, that's why I switched to acrylic. One of the reasons that I switched to acrylic. Because it doesn't bother your allergies. No, no. Okay. And pastels a dry medium. Like, oh. That doesn't bother me either. Okay. So uh, anyway, uh, anything talked else? About you're working on the railroad. Do you want to talk a little bit about how those travels influenced your art? Well, my biological... My uh, father was a uh, chef uh, for the Denver Rio Grande, and uh, he was such a good cook, such a great chef, that he actually went to work for the president of the Denver Rio Grande at his house, Mr. W. F. Freeman, at 1718 Gaylord. He went to work for him and uh, as, a, as a private cook. And... Mr. Freeman's wife, I was just a baby, but she used to hold me, I guess, and talk to me and try to talk to me or whatever. And she uh, told me that when I grow up, she would always year after year tell me that when I grow up and I wanted to follow in my father's footsteps uh, to be a cook, uh, to let her know and she would get me on the railroad. So when I was 15 years old, it just turned 15, I believe it was. I went to uh, down and applied for a job on the railroad. But I did tell Mrs. Freeman that I was going to go down there and apply for a job. And, then, and I did. And the uh, person in charge of the hiring said, well, how old are you? And I said, I, I'm uh, 16. I put my age up a year. And he says, well, 
you have to be 21 to work here because we serve drinks on the railroad and you have to be 21 to serve drinks and, and you can't work in the kitchen because these people all have a lot of experience. And just then the door opened, the man came out of the, and says, if Jess Dubois comes in here looking for a job, put him to work. He said, well, this is him sitting here, sir. He said, yeah, but he's not old enough. He said, I don't give a damn how old he is, put him to work. And that's how I started working on the railroad. When I, and uh, when I was last year, Cole, first year, manual. Anyway, uh, I was probably doing financially as well as the teachers, uh, waiting tables and, and as a cook on the railroad. And also I learned another whole way of supporting my art. I've learned to cook. And uh, so uh, I never had any job, uh, any opportunity like that to... Uh, Mrs. Freeman had made that call. She made that, she made that call uh, that possible for me to continue that. You know, what else would you like to talk about? We have gone through my questions. Is there anything that you just really wanted to talk about that we haven't? Well, I, I just want to say uh, to people who are interested in my life and uh, kids who want to learn or anyone, older people, whoever wants to learn to create on canvas or a sketchbook a work of art and they like what I do uh, and come to me or go to somebody and continue to do what you have to do to reach what you want to be. Uh, never give up. That's the main thing. Never give up. And uh, that's that could be very discouraging and it could be the end of a, a person's uh, using their natural ability and their talent. Because if they don't see it immediately, then they have a tendency to want to move on to something that's totally different. But you have to never give up. That's the main thing. Yeah, we don't right. understand. Right. They don't want to spend the time to do what needs to be done to get where they want to go. That's it. Yeah. Did you see that? Yeah. And you're a great example of putting the time in and getting the results. Yeah, if there's any parts of this that you want to redo, maybe we can go over it. It's kind of caught me off guard in a way because I... But, had a but, busy, but, but we well, will. We could talk oh, yeah. about all of the things uh, before we actually even agreed to do the storm. Um, and you captured all of the things that you had said. Uh, for the most part. And uh, used to paint portraits at the Teller House. That's where the face on the barroom floor is, is, is uh, the artist that did that is very well known for that particular painting. Later in life, I had a chance to see his paintings, a collection of his paintings, which were bought by a, a lawyer, a, a, a attorney, who invested a lot of money in his art and uh, helped him along his path to success. And I had to, I'm like, followed in his footsteps by painting in the Teller House. You know, you just mentioned something that um, there was a time when yeah. artists were supported by patrons, when a, a, a wealthy patron would kind of not adopt, but, but sponsor right. an artist. Um, what are the benefits of a, of a situation like that? Did the artists give up their freedom when they had that kind of a, a financial patron? Um, or were they just, was it okay? Well, it was okay. It depends on the artist. I mean, if you, it, it could make you lazy. If you got somebody that's going to buy all your paintings, then you don't really go as far as you would have gone if you'd have kept the struggle 
to get to where you want to go. If you found somebody that got you at this level and you stayed there, or if you scuffling to get to the top on this side, you might lose that part of it. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So uh, I haven't lost that part. I'm still scuffling to get to where I want to go. We have to say God's not through with you yet. Yeah, right. Okay. I think we've got it.